It's June again, everyone, which means it's Pride Month, and as a celebration of queer heroes, queer creators, and queer joy, DC Comics brings us another star-studded Pride anthology for 2023. Now again, this is another 100-page giant, so I won't be able to cover every story as in-depth as I normally do. I am going to try and highlight a few of my favorites, so with that out of the way, let's hop in together, shall we? So as is becoming tradition with these DC Pride stories, this one kicks off with a foreword from a prominent queer creator, in this case, two-time I Eisner Award winner and artist megastar Phil Jimenez, a man I regret to say it took me way too long to figure out he was actually gay, and it's not like he was hiding it or anything. I guess my own gaydar just happened to be on the fritz that day. In this little essay, he talks about his career, being one of the first men of his comic-creating generation to really come out. He also addresses the rather scary time the LGBTQ community is having at the moment, with new dehumanizing anti-trans laws being passed every day all, all across America, and a general feeling of fear and unease as hate crimes skyrocket and queer art is banned, or otherwise demonized, which in a way makes these DC Pride stories perhaps all the more special for existing. Now our very first story kicking off the pack is from Grant Morrison, who tells another multiverse detail wherein we are again on Earth-36, home to Justice 9 and their Green Lantern analog Hank Hallmark, aka Flashlight. Now according to the newly resurrected Opti-Man, this world's answer to Superman, a strange new alien power source has just been discovered in deep space. Flashlight takes point on trying to get it back because of several other powerful alien tyrants seeking to claim it for themselves. Hank seeks help in the form of Zoe, his former Rainbow Patrol mentor who has sadly been turned half mad and is currently serving a prison sentence to this world's guardians. She says that the real threat in all of this is actually the villain who drove her mad, someone going by the name Inframan. Who, from what I can tell, Inframan is some sort of anti-monitor pastiche who can control the forces of entropy. In a fun reversal of fortunes, Inframan is actually defeated by the return of this world's Flash, Red Racer. Who, as we quickly discover, Red Racer is actually Hank's lover. This is kind of where the story ends with these two tearfully reuniting, but Morrison promises that there'll be more multiversity and more flashlight to be continued. I feel like I'm not really up on my Morrison, and I feel like if I was, I would probably have appreciated this story a bit more. Still, if you are really on a Morrison kick right now. This one delivers everything you could want. Next up, we have a Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy-centric story, and man, after three seasons of excellent TV and finally being allowed to become a couple in the mainline universe, I think these two have somehow managed to assume even Batwoman as the main faces of the queer DC universe. This story, courtesy from Leigh Williams, involves the duo vacationing on the famous Dinosaur Island, where they end up kind of adopting Crush, the wayward daughter of Lobo, who also crash lands on on the island. Turns out Crush was actually on her way to see her girlfriend and now she worries that she's been on the island too long and Katie might think that she completely ghosted her. Crush is also very fascinated by how different Harley and Ivy are and yet how deeply in love they seem to be. Ivy says that there's no secret formula for what the two have together. Love is vast and strange and you'll spend the rest of your life trying to unpack it all. After being such good mentors, Harley and Ivy also serve as good wing women helping Crush make her date. It's a cute little story and a nice showcase for elder queer folks being mentors to the next generation and sharing wisdom, a theme that actually permeates throughout a lot of the stories in this collection. Now, the third story is a very interesting one because it sees Tim Drake Robin reteam with Connor Hawk Green Arrow. Tim's cleaning up a bunch of Scarecrow's thugs and waiting for Damien to come to help him out, only instead of Damien himself coming, he sends his new friend Connor to take his place. Which actually ends up leading to some major awkwardness as despite DC continuity being something of a tangled mess, these two actually do remember each other and past adventures they've had. Tim is a little hurt. Connor never bothered to get in touch with him, but was totally gallivanting around with Damien as his brand new best bud. Connor explains that his life has been crazy between cults and death tournaments. Hell, he hasn't even seen his father Ollie yet, which Tim clocks right away as meaning that Connor hasn't actually come out to his famous poon hound father as being asexual, but not a romantic. Tim admits it was hard for him first coming out to the rest of the Bat family is bisexual. Steph took it harder than anyone because, well, yeah. Batman was stoic at first, but he's always quick to accept. He even started taking in more queer cinema. Probably because he's a detective and, you know, he really wanted to understand, you know? They talk more about emotional support systems and how they wish they could have been there for each other during their own coming outs and all the other tough times they've had over the years, but they eventually decide to grab breakfast and reconnect while Damien is actually left behind to finish the mission on his own because, you know, it was either that or talk about 
about his feelings, and obviously Damien wasn't going to do that. This is a fun story that actually does a good job continuing Connor's own personal growth and journey of self-discovery that had started all the way back in last year's DC Pride anthology, and it's cool that they're keeping it going here year after year. They also don't give Connor an easy out or a fairy tale ending or have someone say, oh, well, you should just talk to your dad. Nah, because it's an ongoing battle, and part of coming out means that you're going to be coming out every day of your life to every new person you meet. Sometimes it gets easier, and sometimes it doesn't. And that's what I felt this story was really trying to talk about. After that, we get more on Jules Jourdain, aka Circuit Breaker, the newest master of the Still Force who was created back in the Lazarus Planet event, who everyone seemed to think was based on Ezra Miller because they were a non-binary actor, but personally, I don't see it. Maybe it's because they're not choking someone or committing crimes. This story is called Subspace, and at first I thought, oh, it's gonna be a story about the science fiction concept of the same name, but it's actually a story about Jules coming to terms with the changes in their body, brought on not only by their new superpowers, but also how it relates to them first taking testosterone. There's also a few small references to the other kind of subspace, the kind you would find in kink culture, which I know the overlap between gay culture and kink culture has always been something of a hot topic, especially now more than ever, as the older LGBTQ generation clashes with the younger, more online set. Riding shotgun in this adventure, too, is Jess Chambers of Earth-11, the other famous non-binary speedster who gets a ton of play in these Pride collections. Apparently, Jess knows Jules from the future, and Circuit Breaker ends up alright, so much to the point their family ranch, the one owned by the very people who disowned Jules in the first place, got turned into a super-hot, multiversal nightclub. Well, damn, if that isn't poetic justice, I don't know what is. Overall, I like this one, but I get the distinct feeling like Circuit Breaker would probably be better served as a backup story in the main Flash book and not hidden away in these special anthologies where there's always going to be less eyes on them. Shame, too, because visually, this one was really striking, maybe one of the best-looking ones. Now, it wouldn't be a full Pride collection without Midnighter and Apollo getting in on the action. They got a movie coming out soon, and this newest story finds them channeling their inner Pink Panthers by actually taking to the streets to defend the gay community from violence at the hands of bigots. Midnighter and Apollo love each other very much, but that still doesn't mean they don't end up getting into real philosophical moral debates. Naturally, Midnighter just wants to cave all these dudes' heads in, because, hey, after all, things only seem to be getting worse and worse every day. The actual government is against them. The original pride at Stonewall was a riot, so why don't we fight back? Apollo, though, perhaps softened by all the time he spent with this world Superman, says that they need to set a better example. It's here that Alan Scott, the Green Lantern, flies on in and acts as mediator for this argument, sharing generations worth of queer history that he's managed to accrue over his decades as an out superhero. In fact, we get many references to real moments in gay history, like the AIDS crisis, marriage inequality, as well as real crusading heroes from the gay community like Marsha P. Johnson and Harvey Milk. Alex Scott ultimately says that he has faith in tomorrow for their people because, well, they have love on their side and love conquers all. And hey, you know what? We should share some love with the world right now. Yes, that's right, everyone. It's time for a big wedding as Midnighter and Apollo actually end up tying the knot where everyone in the world can see it. Yeah, I think this one might actually be my favorite in the entire anthology. I love how it manages to seamlessly weave together a lot of real pull from the headline issues as well as just having some good old-fashioned cool superhero action. And, you know, a wedding. I'm just a sucker for weddings, especially a superhero wedding. Now, probably the most unexpected story in DC Pride 2023 is a team-up piece for Ghost Maker of Batman, Inc. and Catman from my favorite super team, The Secret Six. You know, Gail Simone actually wanted to make Catman bisexual in her original run, but it got shot down. Thankfully, though, she was able to rectify this in the New 52 stories. This one is probably an even more straightforward action piece than the previous one, but they do add some rather interesting dimensions into this when we realize that Thomas Blake and Ghostmaker might actually have been an item in the past. Huh, how about that? What a fun and interesting little take on Batman's own relationship to Catwoman. From there, we get a Christopher Cantwell story that teams up John Constantine and Jonathan Kent, which I guess makes sense because in 2001, Christopher Cantwell actually came out as bisexual, and this story teams up probably two of DC's biggest bi icons. Basically, it's a magical heist story wherein Constantine is trying to win back the soul of a man that it's implied that he loved from Felix Faust, but to do so, Jonathan Kent, the Superman, has to throw a fight. It's pretty straightforward on the page, but more interesting when he actually peel back the layers, like, oh, did John actually ask Superman John Kent for help because he knew that he would be willing to assist him where his dad might not? Is this like a Friends of Dorothy situation? Either way, a fun little team-up, and it would be cool 
to see these two bounce off each other a little bit more in the future because they are so diametrically opposed. Now, the big finale of this year's collection actually kind of breaks from the traditional comic book mold because it's a big, huge love letter to the life and career of Rachel Pollock. She worked at Vertigo during their heyday, and truth be told, if it wasn't for her, the Doom Patrol and Constantine, two series that have always been light years ahead of the times when it comes to queer representation, might never have existed in the first place. It's a great read, really in-depth, honoring a true champion of both equality and the arts, a great way to end this year's collection. And so that was DC Pride 2023, everybody, and I gotta say, this is another really strong offering of stories. I thought three years into this, the quality might end up dipping or drop off, but it actually seems like DC and its creators are more resolute than ever in making this a yearly tradition. I appreciate this year's offering of stories for actually having kind of a strong through line and theme with it about the different queer generations interacting from each other, clashing and learning from each other. There's also just a lot more people chilling out and people being people, which I really enjoy as well. I suppose that's the book's commitment to actually honoring the whole queer joy side of things. You know, it doesn't always have to be stories about gay heroes fighting for their own rights and fighting for equality. Sometimes just existing is itself an actual form of protest and defiance, and I think I can get behind that. Overall, I would give this one a very strong 8 out of 10. Good stuff. If you liked the other two DC Pride anthologies, you're gonna like this one too. And because this is YouTube, I now await my comment section becoming an open sewer. Hey there everyone, it's your pal Kate Joel again, and if you're seeing my face right now, that means you watched at the end of the video, and I'll always be grateful for that. Retention helps in this crazy YouTube game, and so does becoming a patron. If you head on down to the description, you can find a link to my Patreon page. Recently just redid all the tiers, a lot of cool stuff offering up there, exclusive commentaries, exclusive polls, uh, behind the scenes concept art for Capes and Quest, that's the brand new D&D show I've started soon. Never been a better time to become a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month and help the channel grow and you know help me continue to deliver content like what you just saw so i want to thank you all and i will see you again next time bye bye